Living longer, living healthier, living better than ever before. Welcome to Mountain Pacific's Healthy Living for Life, a weekly series that gives you the information, education, and expert insight you need to become an active participant in today's ever-changing healthcare climate. Here now is today's program host. Investing time and money into estate planning will not only protect your loved ones, but will also ensure your wishes are carried out after you're gone or if you're unable to communicate for yourself. If you own property and assets, estate planning is important to your peace of mind and financial security, regardless of your age. Welcome to Healthy Living for Life, a show dedicated to helping you do just that. I'm Lisa Sather, your host. Today we're going to talk about estate planning and trusts. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Healthy Living for Life. Joining us now is Catherine Monroe and Joel Silverman, attorneys from the Silverman Law Office. Joel and Catherine specialize in estate planning, trusts, and estate administration. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. So Catherine, first off, let's start out with you. And could you talk a little bit about why estate planning is important for folks? It's, it's very important, and a lot of people think that they don't have any wealth, and so they're just gonna not plan anything. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are a lot of people who are millionaires out there, and they don't know it. But if, for example, if you have a house that's worth 350000 if you have some IRAs that are worth 450, and some investments and vehicles of any kind, then you're a millionaire, mm -hmm. and you really should plan. So property is a function of state law, and each state has a system that if you don't have a will, then they will tell you how your property is going to go down to the next generation. And if you're happy with that plan that the state has, then you don't have to do anything. But if you don't like the state plan, you need to get a will and do some planning for yourself. And it's important, too, for avoiding probate. If, if you don't want to go through the probate process, which is a process of transferring property through the court system, mm -hmm. then you need to plan something so that it, it uh, avoids that. Excellent. So when we talk about estate planning, what exactly does that entail? Maybe Joel to you. Yeah, Lisa. Well, it's really important that for our families that we set things up so that they're taken care of. And estate planning is the key to making that happen. So it's protecting what we've built through our entire lives and protecting our children. Because what we don't want to do is potentially, in Kathy's example, is have our children, who may be very young, inherit a large sum of money. Because life insurance, oftentimes, is a big key component of our estate planning. And our estate planning brings together all our assets such that we can transfer it either by will, trust, or beneficiary designation, such as a uh, payable on death or a transfer on death designation, and that's usually financial accounts. Uh, but so we transfer those to the next generation or to charities. Excellent, makes complete sense. So let's talk about how estate planning provides protection and certainty for a person's spouse and loved ones. How does that, how does that work? By planning now, you plan while you have capacity mm -hmm. and your plan is written down. So when you pass away or when you get incapacitated, you can uh, be assured that it's written down, people can follow it, and certain people are designated to take certain roles in your estate. Um, they, if, if you do have to go to probate, then it's all there. Uh, who's gonna handle it and things. Um, some people think that a court will take your estate and appoint somebody and do mm -hmm. uh, run the probate if you're not there, and that's just, uh, not real true. The, usually the personal representative will go in and put in the uh, file with the court because the court has to be asked to, to do something. And so the personal representative will handle all of that. Um, at this point, certainty and stuff is it's written down. You've done it when you have capacity. Everybody knows that it's there. Um, you can also leave a letter of instruction to your people and mm -hmm. say, here's my intent in doing this, and this is why I did stuff this way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you set up a trust, if you have something that needs to have long-term uh, oversight, then you can set up a trust and a trust will do that for you. Good, all right. When it comes to estate planning, what are the primary documents that we're talking about? So our primary documents consist of a will, which is directing the personal representative, the person you want to uh, handle your estate and your affairs, to uh, 
put everything together, wrap everything up for you, and distribute your assets to your beneficiaries. You can have a trust, and that trust can either be revocable or irrevocable, but there also needs to be a will backing up the trust as well. And then we have healthcare power of attorney, which allows uh, underneath HIPAA for anybody to handle your healthcare decisions that you directly list, especially uh, very important if you're incapacitated. Mm -hmm. Then we have a financial power of attorney, which allows somebody to make financial decisions for you if and when that time becomes necessary. And then we have a living will, which is uh, the directive that says that you may not want to be on life support if it's really not necessary for you, if there's no hope of recovery. So let's talk about probate and why does this happen? Probate, <coughs> pardon me, yes. probate as we said is a process through the court and um, it will happen if you haven't made a plan whereby you can avoid it. Okay. Uh, some estates you just cannot avoid it. Uh, if you have real property in your estate, uh, you have to do some planning in order to not have probate. So. Um, it is a process through the court. You cannot file it within five days of death, and then you have to have it open for six months. But in that time, you publish to the creditors, and you also can liquidate assets. Um, it is a, um, <clears throat> the purpose of a probate is to allow the creditors to know that the person died so that they can get their claims in and be paid, mm -hmm. and also to get the taxes done. So this federal and state taxes have to be done also in that process. Okay. Um, we have time for, I think, one last question before the break, and I wanted to quickly talk about, you know, we're gonna talk about revocable and irrevocable trust. Can we, in a minute or so, talk quickly about a revocable trust, what it is and what it's used for? Absolutely, Lisa. So a revocable trust, or if you're on the East Coast, revocable yeah. trust, uh, that is a trust in which it's, a trust is a lot like a company. It's a standalone entity from yourself, but in reality, a revocable trust is an extension of yourself. It is still just you, and it is a way for you to hold your assets so that at your passing, those assets get transferred to your children without having to go through probate. We can also use a revocable trust to help us plan for things like long-term care, uh, children with special needs, if something happens to us at our passing, uh, to deal with pets, and to deal with other family members as well. Excellent. All right, we're going to take a quick break and, and we'll come back and talk some more. We're going to pause here for a short break, as I mentioned, and we'll continue talking about revocable trusts and what you need to know about them after these messages. And then a little later, we'll tackle irrevocable trusts. Don't go away. Welcome back. We're talking about estate planning and trusts with Joel Silverman and Catherine Monroe from the Silverman Law Office. We're continuing our discussion on revocable trusts. Joel, back to you. Uh, what would you say are one, is one of the major benefits of a re revocable trust? Well, the single biggest benefit is just something as simple as flexibility. The great part about a trust is you can, a revocable trust is that you can amend it very readily. Mm -hmm. It's by just making a simple amendment to the trust. We help our clients all the time with that because property may change, mm -hmm. things in their lives may change, family, um, assets, uh, retirement accounts, life insurance. So it really gives us the flexibility to adjust the trust as someone's life adjusts. Excellent. Can you provide us with a few examples of what a person can commonly change with a revocable trust? You kind of mentioned some of that, but um, anything else to add there? Yeah, so when we're talking about things that can change, oftentimes we're talking about the assets okay. is what we're more focused okay. on. But that just leaves things kind of hollow, unfortunately, because the biggest thing we should be focusing on are our lives. What happens if our parents were to pass away and we inherit additional assets or types of assets or something happens with our children? They grow older, they have their own lives, now we've gotta be concerned about grandchildren or great-grandchildren. So it's really the family situations that more often than not cause us to change our trusts. Very good. So can you talk about how a trust helps the grantor or the person who sets up the trust if he or she becomes disabled or inca incapacitated? The beauty of a trust is it is in writing and it lists everything. And the first thing that happens is the transfer from the grantor as the trustee to the new trustee is seamless. It just 
flows. So the trustee then has access to all of the assets so that if they need to sell the house because the grantor is now incapacitated and is in a rest home, uh, the trustee can sell the house, deal with the assets, sign contracts to get them into a home. And so it gives a great uh, certainty to the grantor and everybody knows that the trustee can handle things. So this is an interesting question. If, a, if someone's named in a trust and the grantor has not passed away, can it impact the trust beneficiary's Medicaid eligibility? It's, it's not going to impact it while the grantor is alive because normally in a trust, the grantor gets all the income and everything takes care of the grantor until they pass away. So the beneficiary then isn't going to receive anything until after the grantor is gone. That's good information. So I um, just want to talk about whether, you know, talking about the funds of the trust, can they be used to pay any taxes associated with closing the trust and any estate taxes? How does that usually work? So Lisa, Kathy and I as tax attorneys deal with taxes all the time. And the great part about a trust is it is just an extension of you. It will handle your final tax return as an individual. It will also handle all the income taxes that have to be filed for the trust, as well as if there are estate taxes. And of course, under the new uh, tax regime that we have now, we're in a situation where the estate tax is now over $11 million per person. So even though that's very rare for most people, there still are those people that have that concern and mm -hmm. a trust takes care of it, no problem. Excellent. Can there be tax savings associated with a re revocable trust? Absolutely. I mean, Kathy, yeah. you and I talk about this just ad nauseum almost <laughs> because it's it's one of those things as tax attorneys that we're always involved, in, involved mm -hmm. with. Um, some of the tax savings are often uh, with what we call the step up in basis. So when someone passes away holding assets, they get the step up in basis. Um, you get the K-1s that are reported from the trust to the beneficiaries, so you may get some additional tax benefits from the deductions that come through the trust, as well as there may be some tax savings on the estate tax side. Excellent. So I think a question sometimes people often ask is, can I plan out my funeral arrangements in a trust? Other than having a funeral policy, mm -hmm. yes. The grantor can definitely say, here's what I want for my funeral, and the trust can pay for my funeral and my last illness. The surviving spouse can be taken care of through the trust document. Okay. And then if there's a beneficiary, if you have a trust that's going to last for years and you have a beneficiary that's receiving funds out of that trust, let's say you have a 25-year-old who's going to receive benefits till they're 50, then Definitely put in the trust that if that beneficiary dies, go ahead and pay for his last illness and funeral. Interesting, good. So speaking of beneficiaries, can someone name numerous beneficiaries in a trust? Absolutely, yes, they can. And they can also name, uh, they can do percentages so that maybe three children share it equally or one gets more. Um, the beauty of a trust is the flexibility. If there's a business and one child is interested in the business, you can leave him the business and the others get okay. cash. Um, the other thing you can do is take one piece of property and have several beneficiaries using it at the same time for different purposes. So if you had a ranch with a house and maybe there was grazing or farming there, you could have one beneficiary have a life estate in mm -hmm. that house. You can have another beneficiary have the right to run cows and receive the income. And then when everybody's, when the life beneficiary dies, then you can split it out to the kids in whatever portions you want. And Lisa, Kathy just recently was working with a client and told me how they wanted to uh, have a charitable intent behind their trust and so she was working with them recently to help them meet that charitable intent for mom and dad through that trust. Excellent. Well, thank you. Well, we're going to take another quick break and then coming up next, we're going to talk a look at what irre irrevocable trusts and why they can be an important part of estate planning. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Please stay with us.
Welcome back. We're continuing our discussion about trusts with attorneys Catherine Monroe and Joel Silverman. Thanks for staying with us. Welcome back, folks. So let's talk about a uh, talk about irrevocable trusts now. And can you talk about what what that is? An irrevocable trust is just that. You cannot revoke it. A lot of them are also unamendable and you can't modify them. But it depends on the trust document and how you write it up. So um, it is a separate entity all into itself. It has a separate tax ID number and it is reported on a separate tax return also. So what are the main benefits of an irrevocable trust versus a revocable trust? So a, a an irrevocable trust really is oftentimes utilized as an asset protection trust. Sometimes you'll hear that phrase. And it's because you're trying to either keep the assets protected from maybe yourself because you're a vulnerable person, you're in a weakened mental state or physical state. It could be to protect your children uh, because maybe they have special needs concerns. It may be to protect a spouse who needs Medicaid benefits or even yourself for Medicaid benefits. But it's really all about preventing those assets from being squandered or withered away and protecting whoever the beneficiary is. Excellent. So when would you advise a client to set up an irrevocable trust? We would set up irrevocable trust if the client, as Joel had mm -hmm. said, has a tax problem with the estate tax. And so we would set that up. We also will set up an irrevocable trust if they have a... Uh, if they're going to have a tax problem and need to pay the taxes, we can help set up something that will hold life insurance and help pay those taxes if they're due. The other reason that we would use them is Medicaid planning. And you have your special needs trusts and your special treatment trusts, and those are all irrevocable, and they keep the beneficiary from losing their government benefits. So the very terms of the trust helps them out and keeps them on government benefits. Uh, the main thing is if you have an irrevocable trust, you're going to lose some control of those assets. But as Joel said, they mm -hmm. also come out of the estate. Makes sense. So are there times when a irrevocable trust can be revoked or canceled? There are. It's very rare. Um, <coughs> we've only had a couple examples in our practice where we've run into that. But you basically have to go get approval from the court. I see. And so the court acts as the overseer of irrevocable trusts. And you have to almost in all cases get all the beneficiaries to agree to amending that irrevocable trust or terminating it. And more often than not, the reason you do that is because really the trust is too small. It's a cost uh, savings measure, if you will, to keep the assets for the family. What happens if the beneficiary of an irrevocable trust passes away? It will depend on the trust document itself. Uh, usually you don't have just one beneficiary, so it would go to the others and the proportions it would go would depend on the document itself, how it was drafted. So the trust we discussed today can't be set up without legal consultation, obviously. Uh, what's the average cost to set up one of these trusts? Well, the costs vary greatly. It depends on how much you have in assets, how complicated your family situation is. Uh, the very aspects of your family really dictate kind of how much work we're going to have into it. Um, but you'd be looking at starting at least $3,000 and then going on up from there. Okay. And if someone can't afford an attorney, are there free services available? You can uh, go online to the American Bar Association or the State Bar Association to find out uh, who would be able to help you or what assets or resources are available through them. Uh, the court system also has some information, uh, not necessarily on trusts, but for probates and other actions that you may need to take. Um, and the, there was a third one. Um, you can check with legal services. Uh, they will help people that can't afford it to do estate planning and work with them. So there's obviously a lot of different <coughs> aspects to everything that we're talking about and the average person obviously may not know exactly what direction they want to go. They may not know exactly, might know some of the terminology. So really they would come in and sit down with legal counsel and, and discuss their, per, their personal situation with counsel and then obviously go from there and you all would you know, give recommendations on, on options. Is that mm -hmm. how that works? It is how it works. And 
um, when considering whether or not you need a trust, the beauty of a trust is a flexibility, and we recommend trusts if you have a minor ch child or children that you need to take care of for some time. If you have a disabled child mm -hmm. who is never going to be able to work or live alone, then you probably want a trust. Uh, if you have a child who is fiscally irresponsible, either because they just don't know how to handle money or they're into drugs or alcohol, you can set it up to protect them from wasting the estate. I like them for blended families, a blended family, his, mine, and ours. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to take care of your spouse, but you also want your children to re receive a big benefit, you can set up a trust and split it out to take care of them. And the last one is committed couples, couples who are living together, mm -hmm. committed to each other, but they just haven't gotten married. And so you can take care of that person through the use of a trust. Joel, do you have any parting thoughts that you want to drive home with our viewers about all the info we've shared today? Yeah, absolutely. And that is that it's really just hyper important that we get our estate plans done. Yes. Because without it, we put in so much effort into creating what we've done during life and it can all go wrong if we don't put together a good plan. Mm -hmm. We can negatively affect our children. Um, we may want to impact our community with our estate, and we can't do that if we don't put a good plan together. Thank you. I want to thank both of you. This has been a great topic to discuss today, and you've shared a lot of great information. Thanks for being here. Thank, thank you, Lisa. Thank you for having thank us, you. Lisa. Thank you for tuning in to today's show. Be sure to come back next week. Until then, stay fit, stay well, and stay healthy for life with Healthy Living for Life. Healthy Living for Life is brought to you by Mountain Pacific Quality Health. We'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions for future programs, visit our website at mpqhf.org or call us at 406-443-4020. You can also catch us on YouTube by visiting our website and clicking on the YouTube icon. Special thanks to Fire Tower Coffee House and Roasters. Production facilities provided by Video Express Productions.